So just a few minutes into the second period, still no score. We will have more second period action shortly. But when we return to Nagano, the troubling connection between Russian hockey and the Russian mob, that's ahead after these words. Welcome back to Nagano, everyone. Russia is, of course, a nation in transition, remaking itself into a capitalistic society. But there has been a dark underside to this dramatic transition, and it involves many members of Russia's hockey establishment at home and abroad. Anthony Mason has this report. In Russia, where there is money, there is mafia. The more money at stake, the higher the risks. Some sports are now big business, and mafia groups are taking notice. Russia boasts some of the best hockey talent in the world, so it comes as no surprise that hockey seems to be the preferred sport of organized crime. As soon as the NHL began paying Russian clubs hundreds of thousands of dollars to release their best players, mafia groups moved in and violently. This is the arena of the Red Army Hockey Club. A year and a half ago, the team's equipment manager was leaving after practice when four gunmen came out of the bushes and opened fire. The final shot was aimed right between his eyes. With millions of dollars now at stake in the game, even the top hockey official in the country was not safe. Valentin Sich, president of the Russian Ice Hockey Federation, was gunned down in a contract killing last April outside his home. He was reportedly involved in a power struggle over millions of dollars of Federation money. The investigation is still ongoing. Boris Fyodorov nearly had the same fate as Sich, but the head of the National Sports Fund got lucky when the gun of his would-be assassin jammed. Then he pulled out a knife and started stabbing me. I had the strength to fend him off for just a short time. I put my hand out in front of me, and then he slashed me under the arm. Then he slit my throat. Fyodorov miraculously survived, but the $200 million sports fund did not. Fyodorov started over, but the fund is now worth only a fraction of its original value. Even still, he spends half a million dollars a year on round-the-clock security. But you don't need to make millions to be a target. Athletes like Olympic gold medalist Alexei Yurmanov say they are easy prey. If people want to know how much money you get, they know. Athletes used to be part of the privileged class in the former Soviet Union. They had access to things money couldn't buy for the average citizen. Good food, large apartments, foreign travel. Today, no longer supported by those handsome government subsidies, athletes have to fend for themselves. And the prominence and stature which used to protect them now make them prime targets for organized crime. Some of them have bodyguards. Viktor Gusev is a sportscaster for Russian TV. Special security precautions in their apartments and their flats. But figure skater Urmanov says even that's not enough to feel completely safe. For me, I have to be sure that this bodyguard, I mean, I have to be sure for him, because maybe someday he kill me, you know? That's why some athletes are leaving Russia, not only to make money, but to ensure their safety. Olympian Valery Kamensky was reportedly offered the chance to return to Russia for the same salary he was making in the NHL. He wouldn't even consider it. Kamensky said, even if I had to stay in the NHL, like getting $600,000, and you offered me $800,000 in Russia, I would still stay in the NHL because of the question of the security of my family. Kamensky isn't alone. Fellow Olympian Darius Kasparaitis, who lives in New York, is uncomfortable even visiting the former Soviet Union. This summer I was home for two days, and I was like thinking, what about if somebody's gonna come over and do something to me? You know, I just. It's scary, you know, but 
that's why I try to stay, spend my summer in uh, New York, because I think uh, over there is much, much safer for me and for my family. These days, Kasparitis may be no safer here. The Senate recently conducted a 15-month investigation on Russian organized crime in the U.S. and heard about extortion attempts in the NHL. If you come over to the United States as a Russian hockey player with a multi-million dollar contract, you're a pretty nice target, aren't you? Certainly. Yeah. Attorney Michael Bopp headed the Senate investigation and interviewed a dozen NHL players who told him frightening stories of extortion attempts. Threatened to kill the family he was living with. Uh, his mother, who was back in the former Soviet Union, was followed. The guy was scared. All of the players insisted on anonymity, and most of them said they were victims of extortion attempts. Did you ask the players point blank, did you pay the money? Sure. sure. They all said no? They all either said no or avoided the question. They also avoid going to the police. Instead, Bop said players often turn to another criminal group with more clout. That was Alexander McGilney's first move when an ex-coach tried to extort him, according to Bop's sources. When McGilney got into trouble, he called another hockey player by the name of Slava Fetisov place for the Red Wings. It was their understanding Slava Fetisov called Ivankov, Vyacheslav Ivankov. Vyacheslav Ivankov, nicknamed Yaponchik or Little Japanese because of his Asiatic features, was once the most powerful Russian crime figure in the U.S. Fetisov, a two-time Olympic champion, was chairman of the board of one of Ivankov's companies. Fetisov has never been accused of any impropriety, but last year, Ivankov was convicted on extortion charges. He's currently serving a nine and a half year prison sentence in upstate New York. In Nagano, Russian athletes who win a gold medal also earn the potential for handsome endorsement contracts. But with that opportunity comes another possibility, that they will be targets of organized crime. Some of the Russian hockey players could reap a bonus of $100,000 for winning a gold medal here. 50000 of that would come from the Russian Olympic Committee. The rest would be paid by a powerful Russian financial institution connected with the Central Army Sports Club. But even that wasn't enough to lure some of the other top Russian players to these Olympics. Some of them are fed up with other problems in the Federation like corruption and infighting. Most noticeably absent from these games, Phoenix goalie Nikolai Habibulin, and they would have loved to have had him here playing. Well, when we return, we'll rejoin Sean McDonough and John Davidson for the second period of Russia, Czech Republic. More from the 18th Olympic Winter Games after this message and a word from your local station.